Hi, I am Maria Drushkova from Natural Math. In this video, I ask three circle leaders to share their fears and worries and to tell us how they cope. My main fears were probably what math will I do with these kids? Because um, even though I have all these different backgrounds, most of the formal mathematics that I've done is very, very academic, very schooly, very um, convergent, very um, even algorithmic based. And that, that's not how I wanted to do the math circles. So um, I was kind of worried about that. But it turns out there's this huge community out there of people doing math circles who are really, really happy to give ideas about what to do. So that didn't turn out to be anything I really needed to be afraid of. So you found resources, you found people, yeah. you found support. Mm -hmm. So uh, now that this fear is gone, do you have new ones now that you are an experienced circle leader? Um, yeah, what, one thing that we always struggle with um, that I think a lot of mass circles do, not all of them, but um, a lot of the small mass circles like I, have is um, getting enough students to come because um, if you you re I, I find that you really need to have at least five or six students to have it really be collaborative in a conversation where people everybody has their different roles in the group and one person's going to suggest this thing and the other person's going to be the naysayer and the other person's going to sit there and say nothing and then 10 minutes later say aha and whatever their different roles are so um so getting enough students sometimes is an issue it depends on the age group we do different age groups some age groups it seems like there's a lot of kids but some there aren't and um another I, another thing that um a, a worry is paying paying for it because um i need to get paid for this work, so we need to have students enough to pay me as well. And there's there are some grants out there for um, math circles, especially for startup math circles. Um, although this year, now that we're four years in, our math circle didn't get um, a like startup slash continuation grant. So this year, that's a bigger bigger worry for me now, um, even more so than ever. So so you say well, and yes, with a small circle, it's almost harder to get enough people because you cap it at a certain way right, right. as opposed to advertising widely for hundreds of people you have to keep it small but then sometimes you get too small right that's right like we, we typically say our cap would be 12 I've done it a couple of times with 13 um, because any any more than say 12 for the kind of exploration that we're doing it's really no longer a conversation where everybody can be involved. Um, All right. So, so what, what do you find these kids then? When um, do you find them? We find, well, we started out finding them out in through the homeschooling community because Talking Stick is a um, learning center that's primarily for homeschooled students. They do things during the day um, while most kids are at school. But we also, have had an on, online presence as well. So for the first for the first year almost all of the kids were homeschoolers and then there were a few school kids whose parents had found us online just by knowing about math circles and dreaming that someday there might be a math circle in Philadelphia. And then over the years um, word of mouth has spread about it and we've um, ended up by last year we had a pretty sizable poor population of our say eight to nine year olds um, who were school students too. It was probably about half and half although this year we're back to so far all homeschoolers because one thing I didn't anticipate was that in Philadelphia in fifth grade in the public schools the academics really ramp up. A lot of kids go off to academic magnet schools and now those kids um, who went to school who've been coming to Mass Circle for the past few years aren't anymore. Uh, I, I'm not sure I had many fears. I was just delighted to do it. Um, my fe okay, my greatest fear is that it would the kids would not like it and would stop coming because it was totally voluntary. The parents were paying me to do it, like like tutoring. Um, but 
I knew that if the kids didn't want to come, the parents wouldn't pay. And I was afraid that they wouldn't. And uh, it, that fear did not materialize. Let's just say that. <clears throat> the hard part of it, you didn't ask me about the hard part, but I'll tell you because it occurs to me. The hard part was when there were kids who, well, the worst part was the kids whose parents twisted their arms and didn't want to be there. Um, that was to be avoided, and there's not much I could do about it. Um, but there, the, the hard part, the, the really hard part was the kids who wanted to be there but not on the same level as other kids. And I had to find ways of, this is a social problem, not a mathematical problem. I had to find, let me back up a minute. The mathematical material for a lot of this stuff is such that it can be uh, approached on almost any level. If you're very quick and very intuitive, you can get very far. If you're not so quick and not so intuitive, you can go slower and work hard at it and get some insights. And the hard part was to um, sort of meld those two in a in, in in a group where you could you could take the kids who are way ahead and take the kids who are plodding along and somehow make it into the same thing. You could acknowledge the kid who has an insight and also acknowledge the kid who um, typically the way you did it was um, so Bobby who's a little slower had um, a good way of saying what Jimmy figured out something like that you know um, that takes some skill when you have kids in different in, on, on different levels but I, I, I figured out how to do it that, that's a hard part of it um, then you ask, what are your fears, worries now? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I, I'm not sure I have fears or worries, but I have. I think there's work to do. Okay, and the work to do is to get enough people around who can do this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> there's a gap between. There are some people, and I'm working on this actively in New York City. There are people who know the math and can just look at a problem and solve it and vary it and so on, but sometimes they can't relate to the kids except on a very intellectual level, and that's not quite enough for a math circle. Then there are people who are <clears throat> very good with kids, uh, can get them together, can get them working, but they don't have the background or the experience to go ahead. And the issue is to take both kinds of people and give them the other person's skills. And um, I'll tell you, it's much easier to give people mathematical skills than social skills with kids. Um, the, har the hard part, just unpacking that a little more, the hard part of that is, okay, so you play a game of NIM with the kids, taking jelly beans or whatever, and um, you want the kids to figure out how it works to solve the game in the mathematical sense. But a person who is not mathematically um, sophisticated will mistake the goal of the lesson for learning how to win the game, not learning how to figure out the game. And uh, that, that's, that's an, uh, uh, sometimes an uphill battle because there's such satisfaction in winning a game. Um, and we want a different satisfaction to come through, of course. Um, and you know that that's happening, for example, if the person, you show the person the game and they say, okay, we're ready, we've already played the game, the kids all know how to play the game, what's the next game? So, paradoxically and very contrary to the typical um, curriculum development standards in a regular school, you know that the thing is working if they are going slower through the curriculum. The less they finish, the more the kids are learning, because it means they are going deeper in, and really seeing the, the, the meaning of the, of the game, not that. For me, when I run a math circle, um, I don't care if I do one, um, one activity for five or six weeks. If the kids are hooked on it, I will do it, as long as they're not doing the same thing over and over again, as long as they're progressing. But one of the key um, markers in are you, are you getting to the kids is in this case, are they engaged? And then the first time. And that's the one piece of advice that I would give to anybody starting a math circle. 
don't be afraid. Don't worry. Don't don't have worries and fears. Just do something. If it doesn't work, you whip something else out. If the kids don't like it, um, you, you just start something else. The kids will be fine. They'll be they'll be glad to get rid of the thing that they find onerous, and to get something new. And as long as you have a few things that you can just take out and you know they're sure fire, that's enough. But you should try new things. This is a new area. Um, Recreational math is very old. It's several generations old. It's easily, well, Lewis Carroll, more than 100 years ago. But the notion that we can take this and harness this for learning of students is something new around. So try it. Try different things. And let us know. Let other people know. Um, this, this is a, a new frontier. Well, the biggest thing was um, when I was doing activities for Girl Scouts, I was doing hands-on activities that kind of showed the student, the girls, how to, how what the area of mathematics was about, and about a female mathematician. Um, but uh, I hadn't figured out a way to engage them in deep conversations about mathematics um, during the sessions. So in transitioning to the math circles, um, that was my first task: was trying to learn how to create good questions that would lead students to re discover really deep and interesting mathematics um, and have them carry on a sustained conversation about it. And that uh, is pretty challenging. But um, I've found some things that work really well and learned some strategies for creating those questions. And uh, But I think that's something that is always an ongoing learning process. There's always more to n learn and practice about how to create good sessions and get good discussions going among different ages and kinds of students. Well, I brainstormed questions that I thought could go a lot of places and sub-questions that if the main question didn't quite go where I thought it would or they didn't take off with that one, how could I ask more, drill down and ask more specific questions so that they would. Yeah, my first circle was, um, it was on, it was with, for first through third graders and it was on mathematical origami. Mm -hmm. And so the question I came up with was, what can you fold from paper? OK, very <laughs> and, then, and then we got a little more specific, like, what shapes can you fold from paper? And that was still pretty um, a open. parabola is one of my favorite. <laughs> we did, and we did get there, actually. Um, wow. We talked about, I mean, it was in 10 sessions. And uh, the student, in the first session, the students were um, you know, folding triangles and squares. And oh, I figured out a par parallelogram and, and like that. Um, and we talked about the difference between precise, const precisely constructed shapes and um, constructions that had specific, you know, like with specific moves and rules for how to make them so you could describe it to somebody else and shapes that um, you just sort of kind of folded about here. Um, so we talked about the difference between those kinds of instructions. So it got really to some nice cool. deep mathematics, you know, axioms of origami and um, really got... What an excellent conversation stuff. to have, very deep. It, wow. was, it was a lot of fun and the, the kids loved folding things and every time we got to fold some things new. Sometimes I would bring it up. Sometimes it was their creation, and it was just a blast. So, and had a lot of good deep mathematics explored in the process. So, uh, this uh, you said this is an ongoing uh, fear. Did you have as you got deeper into being a leader, being a leader of the center? Uh, did have you developed new fears? Well, sure. I mean, I'm still struggling to find a good balance between um, enculturating students as mathematicians and allowing for them to be just kids. Um, because I do feel every, I think every um, math circle leader has their own take on that. But my feeling is that um, our purpose in being there is to have a, you know, a serious but fun conversation about mathematics. So on the one hand, I want to maintain that um, math stu we have another program called Math Studio that's more of a uh, free-for-all. Um, mm -hmm. And so if, if they want a place where they can just <clears throat> kind of play near mathematics, we ha have that. But a math circle is an intense conversation about mathematics and mathematical ideas. And um, so during that, it's trying to figure out what's the right balance between um, modeling what it means to have a mathematical conversation and 
um, than, but, but allowing them to take the reins and go. And I think, especially right now, I have a younger circle. Um, and so it's heavier on the modeling that I'm used to and more on the, um, I can't let them just go. They, they input enthusiastically, but they go everywhere. They're kind of completely scattered. Young um, kids really uh, are very divergent thinkers and divergent <laughs> players. They are. So, um, so we've been having a good time. Um, I have a couple, you know, actually I have um, several, we have several math circles and one of them I taught a couple sessions and now other instructors are teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, the other uh, circle, Euler math circle, is the one that I'm teaching every session. Uh, so it's the one I'm more um, uh, involved with, you know, think, planning all the lessons for. And that's the one I'm uh, trying to think about. How do we get our students who are uh, ranging in age from third through seventh or eighth grade to have this deep conversation? They're excited about um, axioms of mathematics. What does it mean to create mathematics or and to break mathematics? What would it take to break mathematics? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's just really fun. They want to know if they can make up uh, a mathematical system around banana splits. And I said, why not? So we're we may get there. Right now we're exploring some what it means to have a mathematical system at all. So we've talked about the reals and fields, um, the structure of the, of the reals. Um, now we're going to be t talking a little bit about all kinds of crazy things that number systems can do, like um, looking at complex numbers, looking at um, braid groups, looking at all different kinds of um, structures that exist mathematically and then we'll come back around to the banana splits and hopefully um, have them be able to make a system that makes some sense to them. Uh, about uh, letting kids be kids, what do you do for that? Just keep, well, just keep on keeping on, I think. We're, you know, try it out. Different sessions. Um, I, I'm trying to allow for more sessions where they get to play. Um, not, um, not in the sense of not doing mathematics, but play around um, splash around with the mathematical ideas a lot more. Open like said, activities, uh, right? That's what well, you mean, kind the, of. The, I know I mean the, the discussion about the banana splits, mm -hmm. like just going for it. Um, but I don't plan to have any activities in that circle. Uh, I'm just like, hands, you know, we're not doing hands-on activities for the sake of hands-on activities with that group. Mm -hmm. um, just because we're trying to um, keep it more focused on discussion. In the next video in the series, our three leaders will talk about their circles from the logistics perspective.